Um, it's my joy to be with you tonight to get to speak. I have so, though, enjoyed sitting on that front row and listening to your other teachers uh, throughout these last five weeks. Uh, we are so have been so blessed by all of, of that to this point. And I, it's no secret to those of you who know me, as many of you, I am in love with the God of the Bible. And but in this study over these last five weeks and even in the last year that we've spent studying the Bible, studying Genesis 1, 2, 3 as we as wrote and prepared, and I don't think I could have ever thought that there could be so much richness about the God of the Bible as there are in the first three chapters of Genesis, chapter th- Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Just so much richness about who he is, who we are, who we were created to be. It's just been a beautiful journey, and I think you guys have felt that way too. So it's our prayer that you have found ways through this study to kind of share the truths that we're learning with um, everyone you meet. Maybe a neighbor or a family member or a spouse or um, just in conversations that you will have opportunities to just kind of share, you know, no matter the age, to just to begin to share, even with your children. I think I, my son Michael is in, in his 30s, but even to share those things with our children, that the word of God speak, as we say around here, a better word than what our children or our family or friends are being taught in and by this present age that we live in. The book of Deuteronomy actually speaks about us sharing these things, teaching these things of God specifically to our children. It says to teach them diligently to our children as we walk along life's way. And I remember doing just that when our son Michael was about, I don't know, five or six years old. I was in an Old Testament Bible study at that time, and we were learning a ton about the children of Israel and how, you know, they kept on returning to idols over and over and over again. And on this day, I remember promising Michael that if he would get up early with me and and go to the very first nail appointment at a a nail salon, a new nail salon, I I promised him breakfast if he would do that. Well, he loved to go for breakfast, so he was willing to do that. So off we went. We had first, you know, first nail appointment at a new salon. We're sitting in the big old couches, and it's going to be in and out. This is going to be super, super easy. So tech comes out, and she kind of does her thing, and she straightens her station a little bit. And then the next thing I know, she leaves, and she comes back out, and she's got, you know, incense and matches. There's a big statue up on the shelf, and she walks over to the statue. She lights the incense. And the incense, you know, begins to smoke next to the big guy. And um, Michael's just looking at all of that and looking at me. And I'm like, it's, you know. So then she goes back in. I'm like, certainly she's going to start, you know, start, start, start my manicure now. She comes back out a couple of minutes later. And she's got a big platter of fruit. And Michael's like, oh, we get snacks. We're going to get fruit. She has a big platter of fruit, but it's not for us. She takes the platter of fruit now and she puts the platter of fruit right up. She like, she presents the platter of fruit to the statue. So now we got the incense, we got the platter of beautiful fruit, we got big guy on the counter. And I realized that this is probably the time where Michael and I should have, you know, discussion about idols. So we go to breakfast, doesn't seem quite right, but on the way home we go past the Buddhist temple, which is on the very familiar corner by our house. Like, this would be a great time to talk to Michael about idols. So I began to share with him about idols. We had the idol talk there, those, you know, those people. So we go home, and you know how sometimes you think, you're sure your kids have gotten this, right? You're sure that they've gotten what you've taught them about the Word of God until they don't. And so a couple weeks later, we're in the car. His little friend is over. They're buckled in the back seat. I'm kind of watching them in the rearview mirror. We, we get to the Buddhist temple, and Michael says to his little friend, he goes, we don't, we don't go to that temple. Mm-mm, no, we don't go there. We go to another church. We don't go to that church because my mom told me that they worship eyeballs there. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, he goes, yeah, they worship eyeballs there. And then I realized, like, eyeballs and idols, they sound a lot alike to a little five-year-old. So all this time, how creepy is that? He's believing. 
<laughs> that they're worshiping eyeballs in the Buddhist temple. I was thinking, like, I should have tried the golden calf that Emily had. <laughs> Who didn't have Amazon in those days? I couldn't do that. If you have your workbooks tonight, you will be, we're going to be taking notes on page 93. But just for a quick moment, I want you to turn back to, I believe it's page 78. I don't have my workbook up here. But that's the page that um, the scriptures were written to us there. And we were introduced and asked to circle a new name in those scriptures for God. Did you guys do that? Is that the right page? Yep. And what was the name that you saw? The Lord God. Yep. And I found it repeated 11 times in that short portion of scripture. So we had you note this in that scripture of this week because it's extremely important to where we're going tonight in our scriptures. At first read of Genesis chapter 2, you may have asked the question, hey, didn't we already just do this? And haven't we already, is this, it seems like a repeat of chapter 1. And we know that you guys are asking that question because we actually asked that question as we read through it the first time and began to write. Well, the answer is yes and no. So chapter one that we have just completed introduced us to Elohim, which is God most high, the powerful, the creator, the big God, who may um, have a tendency to us to feel distant or even maybe like relationally trans transcendent to us. But the Lord God of chapter 2 is the personal, the intimate, the covenant name used for God, used for God that is in relationship with his people, relationship with us. And so the use and the placement of every single name of God in the scriptures is always with a purpose. There's a reason that the Lord God is used in chapter 2 instead of Elohim, creator God of chapter 1, and that reason is intimacy. We're going to see that tonight all throughout. So we're going to get a much more intimate look at the Garden of Eden in chapter 2, but more importantly, we're going to get a much more intimate look at the Lord. I remember growing up Many times my mom would note those that we would, we would meet along life's way and we would begin to talk about the things of God with them. And she would always note when that person in conversation used the word Lord. And she would always say to me, Charlene, anybody can use the name of God. Like anybody can use the name of God. But when one calls him Lord in conversation, they know him personally. They know the Lord like we know the Lord. And you know what? She was right. I have noted that through the years, um, that that use of Lord actually does have a much more intimate feel to us. So let's read the scriptures together. You have them in your book. I'll read them from the Word of God. We're going to read just 4 through 7 to start. And it says this, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord had not yet sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. It is this intimate Lord God who creates the very first image bearer in our text today. From the dust of the ground, who fashions, we love that word, who fashions and forms him with his very own hands. We remember the pattern that Emily shared with us a couple of weeks ago about how God, that was kind of his pattern, was to form something and then to fill it. And we see it again repeating itself right here. We watch as God does that with man. He, he forms him, and then what does he fill him with? God breathes his ruach, his breath of life into the man 
that he has formed, and that formed man from the dust of the ground becomes, we are told, a living being. The book of Ecclesiastes has taught us that long before the foundations of the world, we were in the heart of God. Each one of us was in the heart of God. And as he thought of us and his creation, he also had a a place in mind, a set apart, a sacred place, in which he would not only place Adam, this one that he loved, but that he would also be able to dwell with his creation there. That place was a beautiful garden. We know it to be the Garden of Eden. And because creation is already completed, we've already walked through the creation of chapter 1, we realize here that God is not actually creating the garden, but instead he, as a gardener, is planting this garden. We're going to learn more about that gardener in the weeks to come. He is carefully choosing and placing each shrub, each flower, each tree, with not only intention, but just rich, rich symbolism for the garden where he would dwell with the ones that he loves, his own. In the middle of the garden, we are told that we're going to find both the tree of life and the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then we are specifically told that there is a river that not only waters the garden, but flows out from the garden. It is in this garden, the place where many believe is the very first temple, that the Lord places the first man, Adam, and later he creates the first woman there too, Eve. Now most of us know the story um, before even getting there in our text that it was a piece of forbidden fruit an off-limits tree, right? A disobedient act that caused Adam and Eve to be removed and kept forever from the Garden of Eden. Yet by far, as we think about it, their greatest loss was not the beauty of the garden, um, but it was the immediate at that point and the irreversible loss of the intimacy of the temple that they had experienced being in that very presence of the Lord, dwelling with the Lord. Now, in in an instant, all they had ever known of that intimacy, never to be known again. Many people believe that the saddest verse in the Bible is Genesis 3, 8, which says, When they heard the sound of the Lord God, this is their intimate, their covenant God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day, the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees of the garden. They hid themselves from the very presence that we, you know, spend our lives, right, seeking after. Oh, what a high price sin cost in their lives, and it it costs the same in ours at times as well. It seems unthinkable to us that they could have known the Lord, you know, like so completely, yet still believed this lie that there was something better out there, something he was withholding from them, um, something more. And that they would choose to like go their own way to, to go after it. But man, I was challenged this week, like lest we judge them too quickly, right? I ask you, as I've asked myself this week, is how often have I, like how often have we exchanged the truth, right, of our good God for a lie in our own lives. We've all done that. Chasing after something that we believe is better than God's plan or will be more fulfilling or more satisfying in our lives. All the while, really knowing it's not his best because we carry his presence. We know it's not his best for us. And even worse, we've even done something that we knew without question 
is forbidden by God. Sadly, in big and small ways, we have all been Adam and Eve, right? We have all been there. From that day in the garden forward, then the spirit of the Lord upon humanity, it was rare then, okay? And only a select few were then chosen to be carriers of his presence. And for hundreds of years, there would really be no permanent home for the temple, but instead it would move from place to place by way of a portable tent. And the people of God, well, they would be dependent then on, on prophets and priests and sacrifices and laws for even the smallest hint or feel of the presence or the nearness of God. And for most, really, his presence could only be experienced, you know, from a distance by way of, oh, seeing the cloud by day or, or seeing the fire by night. They didn't personally know it. Moses, though, he was one of the few who knew the Lord intimately in these days in the wilderness. We've read a lot about him. He was the one that the word tells us spoke to the Lord face to face as one speaks to a friend. Now, it's rather confusing because a little bit later we, we read that no one can see God face to face, right? But, but this is actually just the, the, the language of intimacy. And so here, face to face, Moses is really saying what we might say is, is heart to heart. That's the relationship that he had with the Lord. And although the people of Israel were, they, were, they got to witness like many acts of God. They got to witness many incredible acts. They never really knew him. The scriptures say it this way in Psalm 103. They say, God, it says, God revealed his ways or he revealed himself. He revealed his character to Moses but only his deeds to the people of Israel. So, the, so Moses got to, to know him. The people of Israel, they, they got to, to, to see his acts and his deeds. The portable tent, which was the Lord's dwelling in the wilderness, it, it later did become a more permanent dwelling just with the completion of, of King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. And many believed at that that time that this beautiful temple as it sat on Mount Moriah, that this, of course, this for sure would be the place where God would restore to man the intimacy of his presence that had been lost in the garden. Yet, so much like Adam and Eve, Israel turned from God yet again. The temple is destroyed and the people are exiled from the land. We end up leaving the New Testament wondering, truly, if there will ever be a time or a place where the intimacy of God's presence will be restored to his people. There are 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and that silence is broken with the answer to that question. When Matthew chapter 1 Verse 1 says this. Now this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, son of David, the son of Abraham. John said it this way of the incarnation of Jesus. He said, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Made his dwelling in its Greek origin means to have one's tent to encamp with us, to have a tabernacle among us. Some versions say um, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Jesus himself, the perfect temple coming to tabernacle among us. God the Son was on mission from the Father with a plan to buy us back, right? His blood would pay the price once and forever for the sin that had separated us so that we might be fully restored to the Father. And in the very moment of Jesus' death, as a sign and a symbol, remember the veil 
and the Jerusalem temple is torn from top to bottom, forever opening a new and a living way for God to dwell not only among us, but actually in us. What a beautiful, beautiful thing. A people made holy by the blood of Christ, now able to not only be among us, but in us. By way of the cross, Jesus made a way back for us to the intimacy of Eden. Three days after his death, just as the word of God promised, this Christ temple was raised up, never to be destroyed again. The temple never to be destroyed again. Jesus then walked the earth for 40 days after his resurrection, showing himself alive to the disciples. And during those days, he just he shared so much with them about the kingdom of God. It was in one of those very last conversations, very close to his, his ascension, that he speaks to the disciples about it being better for them if he goes, that in doing so, he would send to them a comforter, the promised Holy Spirit. And once again, the temple is on the move, right? The temple is on the move. But this time, the temple is about to move inside. And on the day of Pentecost, the 120, they gathered They first heard the sound of this mighty rushing wind, and then they saw fire, which they would know. They would have known that this this wind and this fire, they were symbols of the Holy Spirit. But the fire that they saw at the day of Pentecost, it didn't come to rest on a bush. It didn't come to rest on a mountain. It didn't come to rest on a tent as it had in Moses' day. This fire, we are told in the book of Acts, it came to rest on every single one of them. And in that moment, the presence didn't fill a room. It filled a people it filled a people. First Corinthians six nineteen says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you? You are not your own. We are living temples. We are carriers of the indwelling spirit. Today, as we sit in this room, The Spirit is no longer among us. Like we feel his presence here in our times of worship, but we feel him from within, right? He's he's not among us. He is now within us. We are carriers of that presence. That very same breath of life that was breathed into the first man at creation, it was breathed into us at new creation, And then it became the wind of our Pentecost. And in his indwelling presence, there is a fullness and a flow of the Spirit like we have never known before in that indwelling presence. We become the Spirit's dwelling place for the purpose of being carriers of that presence to the world. We are portable temples, meant to be portable temples to the world. So we are temples at Meyer. We are temples at Rockies. <laughs> we are temples at the Y. We are even temples at Starbucks. <laughs> we are meant to be living temples, carriers of his presence. And by way of his presence kind of flowing in and through us, all of a sudden, we start to understand the symbolism of these rivers, these rivers that are spoken of so often in the Word of God, this life-giving flow that comes from the, the places of His presence, that often comes from, from the temple, from the throne. Flowing from Eden, it brought life to the nations, Flowing from the temple in Ezekiel, 
it turned a sea that was called dead into fresh water, life-giving flow of fresh water that then went on to nourish trees and that bore fruit and provided healing. And finally, in the book of Revelation this week, we looked, we saw that river flowing from the throne of God in the holy city of God to bring healing to the nations. John 7, 37 and 38 says, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. For whosoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. By the power of the Spirit of God, we have these rivers of life flowing in us and flowing through us, life-giving water that is intended to flow out from us as we share Jesus to the world. We are not filled with living water for Sunday mornings or for Tuesday nights so, you know, that we might, you know, have a word for our sisters or, or sit and feel his presence not filled for those times. We are not filled to be pools or reservoirs or cisterns. We are filled to be rivers, right? We are filled to flow. The prophet Joel in the Old Testament, he spoke of these days that we live in right now by saying this. In the last days, God said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. In the book of Acts, he references Joel's passage on the day of Pentecost. In this way, he says, these men are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only the third hour of the day. And then he goes on to say, No, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he goes on again to share the scripture from Joel. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all people, on all flesh. We are living in the this is that, right? We are living in the end days. This is that. These are the times that were spoken of up, up by the prophet Joel. The days when God is pouring out his spirit on us. He's pouring out his spirit. And we have been filled to flow to the nations, to flow to the world in these last days, to bring life-giving water, not our own water, his water, the life-giving water of Jesus and healing of Jesus to the world. The living water that, you know, flows from us, it must, it has to speak to the world of our triune God. It has to speak to the world about a father who loves them. It has to speak to the world about a savior who died for them. This life-giving water speaks of a, of a spirit who, who longs to dwell and commune with them. This world, our world, in this day, needs the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, more than ever before, truly more than ever before. And my prayer for us is that we would stir up the gifts that are within us to allow the, the wind of the Spirit and the life-giving flow of water to flow from us, to flow from our lives, to flow through us to the world. As you just kind of close your things up, I just want to have you sit quietly with me for a minute. <clears throat> Maybe
Maybe you are here tonight and, and you long for the feel of this, this wind of the Spirit or this flow of water that you have once known. Or you, maybe you long to be refreshed again by that living water. Maybe it once flowed so freely and so purely through you, yet it's not feeling that way tonight. Maybe it feels like the wind of the Spirit has stilled a bit in your life or the water, the, that living water is, has become a little bit muddied or it's become a little bit hindered or, or maybe even blocked. There's a peaceful creek that flows through our cabin property in Charlevoix. And each year, each spring, about now, our guys, they... They put on waders and they put on raincoats and, and they, they walk the creek and they free the flow of the creek. The flow, it has become hindered by debris or sticks or logs or, or leaves, sometimes even a rock that the flow of the water has brought to the surface. And as each hindrance is removed, the flow of the water is just freed in a greater way. And I, I just believe that this is such a beautiful picture for us tonight. Maybe the debris that's, you know, been left in your life by bitterness or unforgiveness or disappointments or betrayal, abandonment or rejection, maybe they... They just have a way of hindering sometimes the life-giving flow of this living water. We have all experienced that at times in our life. And so as we sit quietly tonight, let's just walk the creek together, okay? And let's just let the Holy Spirit be our guide in identifying that debris, in allowing him to just, in these next few moments, just gently just reach in and just begin to move anything that might be hindering the flow of the Spirit's wind or the Spirit's water, that life-giving water in your life. And we're just gonna, we're just gonna pause for a minute right here and just let you do that work alone with the Spirit, and then we're going to pray for one another. In any given season um, in any of our lives, we will find ourselves in one of two places, okay? And so as I share those two places, I, I want to kind of identify first where you might be. And so the first of those two places would be that you, you, have, you feel like you are filled and you are refreshed and, and you are, um, are ready to just be the flow of that life-giving water to another. You just feel that you are in that moment. And, and every, you know, every time we come, it's different, but tonight as you sit here, if you feel like, I, I feel refreshed and, and I feel that there is a river of life that is certainly ready to flow from me, from my heart by way of ministering to another tonight, that's the first group of people. And then the second group of people on any given night are the ones who are saying like, wow, I am so thirsty. I am so dry. I am so dry, and I am asking God. I am far from refreshed, and I am asking God for that living water. I am asking for a full refreshing of that living water. I'd love for us tonight to just begin to minister to one another and, you know, if, you, if you're in that first category where you feel like you are full and you are, you're feeling like the Lord is saying, like, I have 
my living water that, that is going to flow through you as you, as you pray and, and, and you minister with just one other lady in this room. If you feel that, that God is saying that to you tonight, that you are the one who is to lay hands on another woman and just, just pray for refreshing for her, then I'm just going to ask you to stand up and come to the front. I'm just going to ask you to come. If you feel, now this might be out of your comfort level. This might be something you've not done before. It doesn't really matter because he'll, he, that living water, it comes from him. It flows through you. He will show you just exactly how to pray, exactly as you listen to the Spirit of God, exactly how to pray, exactly what those needs are. Praise you, Jesus. Now, for the rest of you, another day could be flipped. You could be here, and we could be there, right? We've all felt that before. And so tonight, I, I'm just going to ask you, would you let your sisters right now, would you let them minister this life-giving water to you tonight? Now, that's going to be just as simple as they're laying hands on you and just, and just praying for the river of God. And what is the laying on of hands? The laying on of hands actually says, God, if, if there is anything in my heart, my spirit, my life right now that, that I could, by the laying on of hands, impart to another, would you do that? Would you, would you just impart any life-giving flow that is in in me tonight, would you do that for my sister? As you come forward, I don't really want you to chat much, okay? I want the Holy Spirit to speak. If you have one thing that was identified for you in your creek, you may just say that one word, okay? And the Holy Spirit that is filling these ladies is going to show them exactly how to pray for you and exactly, you know, what your needs are. And so we're going to we're going to shut off live stream. We are going to just just be us here tonight just in the intimacy of this room and we're going to just take as long as it as it needs to be. And I'm just going to have you come forward and just just go to each one of these ladies. You have to don't have to know them. Don't have to know anything about them. Just trust that God has put them here for you tonight. Praise you, Jesus. spirit for any flow of living water. God, we just ask that you would stir in our hearts, stir in our sisters, that we might ask for that. Be willing to let another just lay hands on us and just impart that to us in Jesus' name.